Hi, everybody. It's a pleasure to be here again in the one more Goldred Talks. This time with nobody less than Alex Knight, one of the giants of the TOC history. Imagine to talk with someone that has the manuscripts of the goal. Someone that met Ellie even before he wrote the goal, when Ellie was spreading the TOC ID US. I remember that time we were having this conversation at my home in Brazil, Alex, was really unforgettable. So Alex, it's a pleasure to have you here. Please introduce yourself. So hi, everybody. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and have the opportunity to talk with you. Uh, I'm always ready to support Oreo in everything he does. He's one of the true leaders himself of, of TOC. Uh, <laughs> my own background actually is an interesting one with TOC because it started when I was uh, 28 years old, which, as you can see from the color of my hair, is quite a few years ago. Yes, uh, well over 30 years ago. And in that day, those days, I was working at a business school in the UK, a business school called Ashridge Management College, which was one of the top European business schools. And I was very, very early in my career at that time. In fact, I was nothing more than a researcher under development. So the sort of lowest form of academic life that you had in those days. And I was lucky enough to be working on a project for the chief executive of the organization, uh, a very clever man called Philip Sadler. And he was going to go to a conference in London. It was a conference that was set up for all of the chief executives of all of the business schools in Europe. And uh, unfortunately, on the day of the conference, he was ill. And uh, he phoned in and said to his secretary, send Alex. So I got to go to the conference instead of my boss's 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 boss. Uh, and when I walked into the room, uh, the conference was actually being run by Ellie. Uh, and it was one of his first ever conferences that he ran. Very small group, about 20 of us in the room. Uh, and it had in the room all of the good and the great of the executive business schools of Europe. So there was people from London Business School and INSEAD and IMED and many other people from the top schools and very senior people, many of which had lectured me at my university day. So I was the student in the room. Uh, and Ellie then launched into a three day conference with these people. And I remember it because it changed my life. It literally had one of those moments where everything in your life changes, mainly because I just finished my master's degree uh, and I just written my thesis all around how to manage complex manufacturing environments. And I think we were about 40 minutes into Ellie's presentation when he basically disproved the fundamental assumption upon which the whole of my thesis was based. So the last <laughs> three years of my life, he just, one of those lovely Ellie sentences, he just demonstrated that not all resources are equal. Some resources are more important than others. And if you don't treat them differently, uh, then you're going to come up with the wrong answers. And I'd come up with a wonderful optimization solution that had was based around all resources being equal. So within no time at all, I felt this big in the room. I didn't have, at this part, I didn't remember. <laughs> you did, he destroyed your thesis. He destroyed it. Literally, he destroyed the whole thing. And uh, I remember at the end of the first day, a lot of other people's assumptions had been challenged. Uh, and at the end of the day, I was the last out of the room. Why? Because I was sitting at the back of the room. <laughs> and... Ellie said to me, as he always did in those first early days, it was great, wasn't it, Alex? And I said, well, I'll be interested to see how many people come back tomorrow. Uh, I'm British. I'm very polite. I always, uh, <laughs> because he, I thought he'd been so challenging that maybe he would lose some of the audience. But of course I was wrong because everybody came back the next day. But for me, he took me to one side and he started talking to me. And that became the basis of our friendship for the next 35 years. So much so that I think that evening, it was based down in London, and I think I left at about three o'clock in the morning with no hotel to stay in, uh, to be back in the classroom at nine o'clock the next day. 
Um, so my introduction to Ellie was one that was uh, staggering, really. It was it was a real challenge to everything that I'd spent the previous whole of my educational career learning. He managed to uproot those assumptions and get me to start to think differently. And that was the privilege, really, of being coached and mentored by Ellie over the next uh, 30 so years. Uh, it, it was an amazing experience. Um, I worked in, on many projects with him. I uh, went around the world with him. I sat in on many, many of those early presentations before the goal was written, before uh, TOC was even TOC. It wasn't even called TOC in those days. And I watched Ellie meticulously and, logis and logically give a um, simple explanation to these very complex situations and time and time again uh, get people to see things differently. And for me, that was his skill. He didn't just get people to see things differently. He got people to see differently. He actually got them to see the world in a completely different manner. And that was what was so astonishing about those, um, those early days of, of working with Ellie. I, uh, wow. I, uh, I loved every moment of it. I felt very, very privileged uh, and uh, was just lucky enough, really, to spend the time. I also meant spending many days. Uh, I was allowed to go and visit him in his house in Israel. And his lovely uh, wife used to look after us. Uh, as we spent the nights talking about various topics. And because I came from the UK, and in those days we didn't have much of a, a manufacturing industry, he helped me think through how to apply TOC in many, many different industries, in the banking sector, in the insurance sector, in tourism, and also uh, in places like healthcare, which I ended up spending a lot of my time on. So a fascinating introduction to Ellie. By the way, I think it's because of Peter wrote this book, right? You're absolutely correct, yes. Yeah, uh, tell us a little the story of Friday Joy, please, Alex. Well, um, my English teacher at school uh, always gave me a very poor grade for, for my storytelling. Uh, but it was Ellie who inspired me to, to write the book. Uh, right close to one of the last times I ever saw Ellie, uh, he, he asked me, well, he asked me, it was an Israeli ask, yeah, you don't say no to <laughs> I can yes. imagine, believe me, I can imagine. <laughs> but he asked me to do three things, one of which was to uh, write a book on the healthcare solution that he'd been helping me develop over all those years. Uh, and it was a fascinating moment for me. We were sitting in a car park outside of the hospital where he was being treated in his final days. He was sitting on a bench and above this bench there was a no smoking sign. He was sucking on his pipe and uh, telling me about uh, the next book he was going to write and explaining to me uh, that I must also write the book uh, Pride and Joy. And it was in that moment that I agreed to do it and I committed to do it. Uh, and it, it was one of the most exciting things I've done in my career, really. Um, I was very lucky to have somebody to help me with, with some of the writing of it. But uh, everything was really based upon what I'd learned in all those years being coached and mentored by Ellie. I took the challenge of writing it as a story, just like the goal. Uh, and I based it upon real characters, uh, everyone that I've worked with over the years. So if you read the book, everyone that you see and all the conversations that happened are for real. They're actually part of a true story of projects that we've done in healthcare over the years. But it was down to Ellie's inspiration that got me to, to put the, the book together. And I recommend you all have a go. It's not easy, but it's definitely very rewarding to do something like that. And Alex, one of the things I always like to talk with you, it's because it's not about applications only, right? You really got the, the meaning of TOC. And to exemplify that, please explain why the title of this book is Pride and Joy. So uh, that's a, a really good question. Because for me, TOC has a number of different dimensions to it. Obviously, Ellie was famous for the applications that he developed, which was taking 
the principles of TOC and developing them for a specific situation, a specific industry or something like that. And that's what I tried to do uh, in healthcare with his um, support. But behind that, there was a way about of looking at the world. Ellie was always interested in the unusual. Yes, he was. I watched him so many times do an analysis of a situation that he was new to him. And I always remember the approach he adopted. He would never listen to a word that any expert told him. Anyone who knew <laughs> about the industry, he would never listen to them first. He would always start by seeing if he could develop his own hypothesis based upon the situation that was presented in front of him, based upon the undesirable effects or whatever that he saw in the industry. And he would come up with his own hypothesis first. And then, and only then, would he discuss with others about whether or not there were flaws in the hypothesis that he developed. And it was through this brave approach of saying, I may know nothing about the, I, the, the situation, but I understand the principles of how systems work. He understood about dependencies. He understood about variability. He understood about how all these things interacted. And so he could almost go into any industry and very quickly identify what the uh, core issues was. So that was the first level below the applications. Those were the principles in which he developed the applications. But beneath that, there was a mindset, yes? And that's what he didn't really articulate towards till towards the end of his life, yes? When it was those basic assumptions upon which he believed in which helped him to come up with those solutions, yes? And that was the starting point of people are good, yes? Mm -hmm. However frustrating the situation, and I can tell you, I put him in many a frustrating situation. I was a slow student to learn, yes? But he never gave up, yeah? He always assumed people are good, and he always tried to understand why, if people were bad, there was something driving that uh, poor behavior, yes? It wasn't they weren't born like that, if you like. Mm -hmm. He always believed there had to be a, a simple underlying solution to everything that was around him, yes. He really genuinely believed in inherent simplicity, yes. If the world was that complicated, we wouldn't be put on this planet, was what he always used to say to me. We were put on this planet to try and understand the simplicity that was there. And it was that belief that helped him to develop those ideas out of nothing. Um, it wasn't that he was an expert in these industries. He knew nothing about the industries when he developed these breakthroughs. Yeah, He learned by doing and learned by starting. And then he always went back to first principles. Yeah, He was never, ever frightened of what some people would say is showing his ignorance. Yeah, He mm -hmm. wanted to check the basic principles upon which the discussion was being had. And time and time again, he found a flaw in those basic assumptions which enabled him to build a solution. Mm -hmm. So actually a very, a very simple process that he used in every instance. Uh, Barak, how do you make the connection to pride and joy, the name? Okay, sorry, I, I diverted there. No, so, that's amazing. So pride and joy is one of three ingredients to the solution that we developed in healthcare. We called the book Pride and Joy for two reasons. Yeah? The first is by far the most important reason. One of the things Ellie taught me is if you implement a good solution, a new idea, you should expect, you should be able to predict the positive effects that are going to be an outcome of your solution yes mm -hmm. and for me in healthcare one of the most important effects after you've delivered all the breakthroughs in productivity and the improvements in quality and all the rest of it is that you've created a system where the people who work in the system can be proud of the work that they're doing and in a very difficult situation they can still enjoy everything they do they can be proud of their work and they can enjoy it. 
not just the staff, by the way, but also in a funny way, the patients as well. Hospitals live in communities. Yes, they are often a very key part of a local community. Lots of people work there and they know lots of other people in the community. So if you can create pride and joy in the workforce, you will create pride and joy in the community. So that's the main reason why I called it pride and joy. It's the ultimate positive outcome that you want from an implementation yeah. of this approach. The second reason is a stupid reason. Um, uh, I play the guitar and my favorite guitarist is uh, somebody called Stevie Ray Vaughan, who, uh, who uh, we lost at a very, in his very early part of his career. He was a Texas blues guitar player. Anyone that knows his music, you'll know his very famous song called Pride and Joy. I took it a little bit further in the book. The book has 24 chapters, exactly the same number of bars in Stevie Ray Vaughan's Pride and Joy guitar solo. <laughs> nice. Very nice. Now, the book is one of three parts of the solution because um, the book is there to try and help people follow through for themselves to check out whether our analysis is correct, whether our proposed direction of solution is correct, and whether it would work in their environment. And that's what the book's really all about, helping somebody to develop their own understanding and see whether the solution makes sense for them. Some of the most fantastic feedback I've got is from doctors and nurses, frontline staff, who say, Alex, you must have written it based on my hospital. Yeah, and that's the, the, the feedback that I enjoy the most. The second thing uh, that we developed was uh, a software tool to support the book. Now, I'm no software expert, and I never want to claim to be, but it became very clear to me that hospitals are actually quite chaotic environments, yes? Uh, and there are many variables that are oscillating around all the day. Patient mix, resource availability, volume demand, yes? Written a resource, right? Yes, capability of resource. Yes, absolutely. It's it built upon a place of learning. Most hospitals are places where people learn, so their capability is obviously going to change as their career changes. Yeah. So an environment with many, many variables. And although the TOC solution does bring a very simple solution to this environment, and it does need yeah some support yes in that sort of environment and that's why we built the software um to, to help with that environment so that's the second thing the third thing is i wanted to make the solution available on a global basis yes and i wanted it to be available for lots of different consultancies and lots of different organizations both healthcare and otherwise i didn't want to be our own constraint to the solution so the third thing we wrote was a sort of implementation guideline based around a strategy and tactics tree uh, so we we wrote the full strategy and tactics tree which is one of the tools that ellie developed for this particular environment and by um, the way my feedback to it is one of the most complete s and tree i ever saw it's almost perfect there's nothing to change right it's there oh. everything is there a lot of experience easy to understand is the real meaning the objective of s and right? To communicate the logic, to communicate the secret, it's amazing. Well, it, thank you very much for that. Because to be honest, it took longer to write than the book. And it was more of a challenge to write than the book. I can imagine. Uh, because it's, uh, it's about 150 pages, I think, of pure logic, which is never, never easy. And uh, it was one of the other promises that I made uh, to Ellie. So that was uh, another, another one. Uh, delivered on so uh, I was, I'm happy to have done that and uh, one of the things we're doing now uh, now what we've proven the solution for so many ex different environments we've applied it in acute hospitals in mental health hospitals in community hospitals in social care in many different environments what we're now doing is putting together the package so that lots of people from around the world uh, can have a go uh, my book's been translated into Japanese by my wonderful colleagues in Goldratt Consulting in Japan. Uh, it's also been translated into French, actually for the French-Canadian market. 
Uh, and my hope one day is that we'll get it um, translated into Spanish and Portuguese and other, other languages as well. Uh, very because, soon, very soon, I promise you, very soon. We just want it available. It's such an important industry. We want lots of people involved. Yeah. The other thing, the we, sorry, just to finish on that, the other thing that we're doing now is we're uh, making the software available through many different uh, platforms um, because, you know, we're a small organization and I don't want us to be the limiting factor in the use of this approach. Mm -hmm. And Alex, why I like so much the title and the approach you use, you know, to apply TNC in hospitals, because previously, before uh, know you, I made many, you know, many projects in this health industry, hospital clinics, things like that. And it was funny, because it's not easy at all to work with doctors, right, and nurses. I ima imagine like this, Alex, exactly like that. You start a meeting in a hospital, when the goal is to improve quality, and also the financials, the hospital, we need to solve this cloud, right? Yeah. And the talk is like, like that, exactly like that. Serious, like that. Dr. Audio, here, work with lives, not with money. And they better start like that, come on, man. Yeah, <laughs> How yeah. can you start to put people thinking together, right? It's funny, really funny. No, you, you are absolutely right. One of, the, one of the fascinating things about working in healthcare is those frontline staff, those doctors and nurses, they're very, very well educated. Now, the good news about that is if you come up with a good, strong, logically based argument, they will listen to you and they will help you. Some of our best projects have been led by the doctors and nurses because they understand the, the problem that they have. They're not experts on how to manage hospitals. They don't pretend to be. They're experts on delivering health care. But if you approach it with the right mindset of respect for their really mm -hmm. incredible intelligence and understanding of the area, then you'll get their commitment and understanding very easily, actually, to the, to the approach that we've developed. Because at the end of the day, the core of the approach, it's very simple. Let me take you back to the roots of the solution. Yes. Mm -hmm. Hospitals appear chaotic, complex, difficult to manage. Yes. And so what happens is, is everyone tries to improve everything everywhere with all of their efforts, yes? What we said, uh, by the way, against all sorts of different measurements and criteria, the average hospital in the UK has over 160 measures it has to deliver, yeah? So guess how many initiatives they have, that times 10, yeah? <laughs> so what we did is we say, no, let's go back to the first principles. The principle of a hospital is to provide high quality, safe and timely care for every single patient that's in the hospital and is waiting to get into the hospital. It's basically the Hippocratic Oath with volume yes, of patients going through it. Mm -hmm. yes? And what we said is, so let's create a system that is patient-centered and is clinically led. In other words, the how long the patient is going to be in the hospital is not some statistical average. It's based upon the individual patient's needs and the clinical expertise of the staff, which they might change their view as the journey unfolds, yes? And then let's use TOC to identify what's stopping us doing that, yes? So in other words, the objective is a patient-centered, clinically-led hospital. TOC is applied to find out why the hell we can't and which task carried out by which resource is most often causing the most disruption and the most delay. Focus. Yes, that's where TOC helps us. Yes, to find out why we can't be patient-centered and clinically-led. But yeah. the starting point is no compromises, straight TOC, what's the goal, patient-centered, clinically-led, every single patient, the one in the hospital and the ones in the queue, how do we resolve that? By the way, mm -hmm. on the run, we dramatically improve the finances because we stop all the chaos uh, that's going on. Yeah, and we smooth the flow and we increase the number of patients that go through the same resources. Classic TOC. And, stuff. You know, look, Alex, this is not only a side effects in a country like Brazil, for example, where how to finance the health system is the key to yeah. deliver health to everybody. That is that's crucial. 
you really need to take care about it as well, right? Well, I was just on a, a call a moment ago to one of your colleagues in India, yes? And he was explaining that because of the COVID crisis, they have opened up two and a half times capacity of healthcare. So they've added 250% to their healthcare capacity and they still have backlogs, queues and all the rest of it. So it's not about capacity alone. It's about how do I improve the flow? Yeah. So how do I manage these very complicated or apparently complicated systems? Mm -hmm. Underneath them, they're just like every other system. Dependent events, statistical fluctuations, and all the rest of it. And Alex, now to to I'm trying to finalize this this time, and I hope you come back more time. I hope you enjoy to have this conversation. But you know, to finalize, I remember when I show you remember my my wife's methodology to apply TOC in the coach process, right? And you gave me a really good feedback, not talking about details. You know, in a more, you know, mindset of TOC. How really think you put here, how to put TOC in the health system. What yeah. means that, Alex? Which kind of advice you can share with us if you go to a new field or even in a no field, right? If you really get a step back and think, do I have really apply TOC in the right way here? What can you say? Well, uh, your wife's book, Martha's book, is, is tremendous. It's an amazing book. <laughs> Uh, okay. And it really is, because what she did was she took some of the principles of TOC and she has used them to come up with a, an understanding of, of, of a completely new environment. Not a sort of uh, logistical environment, actually how you deal with supporting and coaching people, yes? So it's a completely different sort of world, yes? But she took the principles, yes? And that's what's so important. Uh, thanks, I appreciate your feedback. But my question is more about, you know, the advice you gave me, right? The feedback, so the advice how you think. think. Okay. Well, yes. You know what? I think you need to explore my this side because... Yeah. So the advice I would give to anyone is, first of all, don't be frightened about any industry. TOC can be applied in any industry you like, yes? In the early days, I didn't do any applications in manufacturing or supply chain because I wasn't, didn't have customers in that area. I was doing banking, insurance, healthcare, tourism, all sorts of different industries, yes? So don't be frightened of the industry. Every industry has it. What I would do is I would start by looking for something that's happening in that in industry that everybody sort of accepts as the norm. And yet in reality, It's absolutely stupid. It sounds so simple that, yes, but that's what Ellie taught me. He said, look for the blindingly obvious mistake that everyone is doing, yes? So, for example, when I first started working in insurance, yes, mm -hmm. one of the things that became very interesting to me was they basically re- train and, and grow a brand new sales force almost every year. Why? Because 85, 90% of them fail as salespeople. Yes. So in other words, they have this massive recruitment process, a massive training process to then send these people out to try and sell life insurance. And a year later, most of them have given up. Now, isn't that obvious that that can't be right? Yes. And when mm -hmm. we first looked at that, we actually did two things with TOC. First of all, we did a very simple buffer management system on the recruitment and on the training of these Salesforce people. That was the first thing we did. The second thing we did it was we used the thinking process to identify what were the obstacles in the mind of the customers that they weren't addressing when they were trying to sell these products, yes? And we actually changed the basis of the offer uh, that they were using. So we smoothed the flow of the process and we mm -hmm. changed one of the uh, core parts of how to sell in this sort of environment. In essence, they were trying to use a benefits-based sale to deal with a life-changing uh, sale for somebody, you know, buying life insurance and something like that, yes? Mm -hmm. 
And every single time I go to Ellie and I talk to her about these industries and I'd be going there with a sort of TOC application in my head. And he'd say, forget it, Alex, forget everything to do with the applications. When their time comes, we'll use them. Yeah. The first thing we have to understand is what is so obviously wrong about the way this industry is operating. Yeah. Where are they spending huge amounts of money unnecessarily in terms of it's the only thing they can do? Because if you think about it in TOC terms, what that is, is it's a response to an unresolved, undesirable effect or an unresolved dilemma. So where you are getting a massive response that's costing lots of money, that's taking huge resources just think to yourself, what the hell are they trying to solve? In other words, they are decorating the fish, right? They are decorating the fish. That's exactly mm -hmm. what they are doing, yes? And that's what he taught me. And obviously, uh, Ishai has written a whole book around it, another brilliant book you should all read about that, Stop Decorating the Fish, yes? Because mm -hmm. that's what Ellie taught us all to do, yes? Is to, to focus in on the thing that is really the mistake in the industry yeah and time and time again that's what he would do and then maybe there's an application that can help you solve it but forget about the applications to start with focus in on what's the most obvious problem that hasn't been solved yeah and uh, Ishai and Christine eh, right uh, wrote the book and they mentioned the seven seductors right yeah sedatives maybe the eight one right to TOC guys is to Look for the common applications. No, forgot the applications. Yes, yes. Thinking yes. clearly. Good. Think clearly. Thinking clearly is the starting point of all TOC. Yes. Uh, actually, I don't think I have it here, but my original copy of the goal, uh, uh, which is the original manuscript of the goal, on the front of it, uh, Ellie describes uh, why he wrote the book. And he said, the objective of this book is to teach people to think clearly. That is the biggest thing that I can bring to society is to help people to think clearly. And when you mention the manuscript, it, it's by hand. It's no, it's not by hand. It was, it, was a, ah. it was turned into a book, but it was the, ah. before it was ever published. Yes, in uh, 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 there. And um, in, that, in that book, he signed it for me and he, and he wrote something that perhaps uh, I could leave with you to think about. Because what he said uh, in his, he wrote it in Hebrew, so I didn't even understand it for years. It took me ages to get it translated to find out what it actually meant, yes? But basically said, uh, there is a difference between changing our understanding and changing our behavior. Yeah. And what he was saying is, Education can help us to change our understanding. But we have to look in the mirror if we're going to change our behavior. And the biggest risk is we change our understanding and we don't change our behavior. Wow, and in that amazing. instance, we just become a pain in the ass for everyone. Yeah, because we, we pretend to be the, <laughs> the know it all. Yes. And I what I hope is that people understand the first step in TOC is understand a change in understanding, but the most important step is changing your own behavior. Yeah, you'll never get anyone else to change their behavior until you think through what does the implications for my own behavior. Yeah, too many people are out there preaching TOC. Yeah, and they'll get nowhere with it. Yes. What we have to do is to, just like Ellie did with me, we have to get other people to come up with their own understanding of it. Yes. Uh, and that's what Ellie was such a master at. One piece of homework for every single one of you who watch this video. Read chapter four of the goal again and again and again and again. It chapter is four. Chapter four of the goal. It is the one where Alex meets Jonah for the first time, yes? And mm -hmm. that particular chapter is, is nectar. It's the best chapter Ellie ever wrote, in my opinion, because not only does he get 
Alex to understand that it's a waste of time going to the conference to learn about robotics solution to the 80s productivity <clears throat> crisis. But he takes Alex through a series of very simple questions to come to the conclusion about there is a bottleneck in his plant and the job is to go and find it. And then he does it with three simple questions, three questions. And if you really understand that chapter and you really understand those questions, he really says, have you improved your throughput? Have you reduced your inventory? And have you Im impacted your operating expenses? And if you haven't, how the hell can you tell me you've improved your productivity? Yeah, but he, no, does, it, okay. he does it in a polite manner. Yes. Mm -hmm. So I would recommend read the goal, read it again, read it again, but slow down and read chapter four because it is the most clever chapter, in my view, that Ellie ever wrote. So that's my homework. <laughs> oh, I do it. For sure I do, Alex. I really appreciate your time with us. We deserve, you know, words of wisdom to share with uh, our followers in the Golden Circle. Thank you a lot, Alex. Your last words, please. Um, just to say thank you very much, Ario, for the opportunity to talk to people. I'm very happy to come back. Maybe next time we'll read Chapter 4 together and we'll uh, see just how much there is in there for everyone to learn. But good, good. For now, I'll just say bye-bye to you all and I wish you all a very safe time in these difficult times. Thank you, Alex. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.